Welcome to Science Sci-Fi, connected the public to uh, science and technology through storytelling. My name is Ronis Friedman. I'm an IT professional and uh, science fiction writer. And today we have a special uh, friend or guest, Jeff Kramer, whom I know for about 20 years. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Ron. Maybe um, you can tell us a little bit about you and about the new book that is uh, about to come out. Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, my name is Jeff Kramer. I am a mechanical engineer, and um, I have a company called Big Time Engineering Corp based out of central Alberta. Um, my book is called Infinite Resources, and it's all about developing the Arctic. In fact, there's a, uh, a long subtitle. I'll get to it in a moment here. But um, anyways, it's... It's a, I think it's a timely book because it deals with uh, several issues that are, are plaguing the world right now. So the, the subtitle is How to Develop the Arctic by Supplying Green Hydrogen, Fresh Water, and Healthy Food to the World While Mitigating the Negative Effects of Anthropogenic Climate Change. So a bit of a mouthful. I haven't actually memorized it yet. <laughs> There's a lot in there. Yep. Yeah, so hydrogen, that's an interesting concept. I know it's a, one of the hydrogen could be green or it can be not green if it's taken for natural gas. Uh, natural gas. Yeah. So green, that's made you need another energy source. So I know there is solar, but in the Arctic, maybe in the winter, there is no solar energy. So how? what is your plan? How can I make hydrogen in the Arctic? Well, and that, that's a great way to, to start the conversation because the, the whole book... Um, talks uh, basically hangs on the concept that I talk about in chapter two. And that is uh, tapping into an energy source that we haven't really used up until now. So I would like you to imagine a, a barbecue in your backyard that's run off of propane. And uh, you got a propane bottle, it's under pressure, and Of course, when you turn on the gas, the uh, the propane evaporates from the bottle and goes out to the burner, and and that's how we uh, we get our flame and so forth. Now, what what happens? Have you? I, I don't know if you've ever um, noticed, but in the summer, when you're if you're in a humid area and the propane bottle is getting low, you've been operating it for a while. You might develop a frost ring on the bottom of the uh, propane bottle, and that's because As the propane is evaporating, it's absorbing energy from the environment and it gets so cold that it condenses the moisture in the air. So we can take advantage of that principle in the Arctic. Uh, if you think about what's happening there, you've got in the middle of winter, it might be you know minus 40 Celsius or colder. And then you've got a layer of ice that's maybe two meters thick and below that, You've got the Arctic Ocean, and at the interface between the ice and the Arctic Ocean, it's always at the freezing temperature of the water, okay? And, and that's the same year-round, summer and winter, as long as there's ice in the water, at the interface between the ice and the water, it's going to be at that equilibrium temperature. So um, what does that mean? We've got minus... 40 degrees, then we got an insulation layer, and then we've got water that's at the freezing point of water, which is uh, seawater, which is about minus two degrees Celsius. And if you go down further into the ocean, all around the world, you know, about 150 meters and, and lower, um, there's a layer of water that is about three degrees Celsius. It doesn't matter if it's in the Arctic, doesn't matter if you're in the tropics, it's a layer of water that's basically the same temperature all around the world. So we can pump up that warmer water and have a, a, a cycle. It doesn't have to be propane, but in my book, I, I use the propane cycle for simplicity. And you boil the propane using the relatively warm water. You run it through a turbine and in the atmosphere, you condense it again. And then you increase the pressure and pump it back down into the ocean and repeat the cycle. And from that, You're only limited in how much energy you can withdraw by the size of your heat exchanger in the atmosphere, your heat exchanger in the water, the size of the pipes and, and the um, and the size of the engine that you're using. It's so, basic, yeah. so it's basically uh, like a steam engine, but instead of using water, you use propane that has a 
freezing temperature of something between minus 40 and zero. Exactly. And uh, unlike a steam engine, they typically just release the steam to the atmosphere. What we're doing is we're condensing the steam or the propane in this case and <clears throat> reusing it. So it's a continuous cycle. <clears throat> There's no pollution whatsoever. The only waste that you have is relatively warm air, if you can call freezing air in the Arctic warm. And you end up freezing uh, more of the ocean water. And What's the side benefit of freezing ocean water? Well, when ice freezes, it actually excretes the salt from the lattice of the of the ice crystal. So this has been used in the Middle East. Uh, I think if you go to uh, Iran, they have, like from ancient times, they have these, I think they're called Choctaws, where they would put out, uh, they kind of have a house that, that's um, set up for cooling, it's kind of like a, an ancient re refrigeration system. And they would have a almost like a pond where they would put brackish water in, and then they would freeze it overnight by using radiative cooling to the atmosphere, like to space. And the water would actually get so cold that it would freeze and you'd get a layer of ice. And then they would put that ice in the Choctaw for you know keeping food fresh and things like this. So, uh, the, one of the benefits there is that the brackish water, when you when you take the ice off of it, when you melt the ice, it is then potable water. So we are able to create potable water using this process. And this is uh, actually well known if, um, if you're familiar with the Inuit in the Arctic. In the spring when they uh, go out and do their seal hunting and stuff, they don't have to bring fresh water with them. They can just use the melt water from the, from the ice that's melting. Okay, so now that we have the hydrogen and maybe some water, what do we do with the hydrogen? How do we transfer it to the other part of the globe? And I think on the snippet, I celebrated the version. I remember something that you said that it could be used to water the arid places like desert and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, but, so yeah. I, I talk about uh, several methods of getting the hydrogen to to the market. So it's the middle of winter. And if this is up in the high Arctic, you're going to have, of course, um, the surface of the ocean is going to be frozen. So you can go in with icebreakers and use a regular transport ship. You could, you know, turn the, the hydrogen to liquid hydrogen or compress it. Um, I, I'm actually just finishing the last chapter, a uh, technical chapter, which is called Chapter Four, um, Kickstarting the Hydrogen Economy. I didn't write them in order. This is a, I left this chapter for last because so much is changing in this field uh, in terms of technologies associated with hydrogen and, and so much money is being invested that I want to have this as being the most current of the chapters. But uh, so you could use a, a, tr a regular transport ship to move the hydrogen in the middle of winter with a, you know, say a Russian, maybe not Russian now, but a, 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 an icebreaker of some sort. Um, but I talk about two other options as well. Uh, in Canada's Arctic, uh, we found out after the Cold War that the Russians actually had a um, better mapping of some areas of, of the Northwest Passage than the Canadian military had. And so we... Uh, we have a little bit to, um, you know, to learn and to uh, do to patrol our waters and and map everything. And and right now the Canadian government is building, I think, seven uh, icebreakers, uh, very modern icebreakers, to do exactly that. But uh, so the first option is use icebreakers and transport ship. Another option would be to use submarines. So I don't know if you've ever seen the James Bond movie. The spy who loved me, but yeah, they have sorry. a submarine and goes into this, uh, gets captured by this floating um, oil tanker. Platform. Yeah, this platform out at sea, and comes up under from under the uh, water and, and docks inside there. You could do the same sort of thing with the uh, system that I'm envisioning here, and better yet, the um, we have the technology now to basically automate the entire system in terms of transportation. So you could set up a navigation system in the um, Northwest Passage or wherever the you need to go between the, um, what I call them as polar energy platforms or PEPs for short. Uh, and so mm -hmm. you go from the PEP to New York City or wherever you want to deliver the hydrogen to. 
And uh, when you're going under the ice, you have these navigation buoys or whatever that are under the water. But once you get past the the ice barrier, you know, the, the submarine can travel on the surface if that's desirable, or it could have like an aerial, you know, going up to, to have uh, satellite navigation at that point. And, and it could all be done automated, and then you get close to the coast and, um, you know, some pilot or someone can come out and, and take it the last little bit to, to the dock. So that's that's another option. And then what you're referring to is I just published an article on, on my LinkedIn page uh, talking about the possibility of using hydrogen-filled airships to transport um, the, the gas from the PEPs. And... In the example that I look at, I, I talk about Phoenix, Arizona. Of course, they're experiencing a drought and, and Lake Mead is, is drying up. It's the lowest levels it's been since they uh, filled the dam up back in the 1930s. So water is, uh, is a major issue down there. And if you have a, a city like Tucson or Phoenix, I, I don't know what Phoenix's stats are, but Tucson, the average person there uses about 80 gallons of water a day for residential purposes, not including industrial applications. So um, if you have a PEP and you have these, uh, you know, dirigibles or actually be more like uh, the Hindenburg style um, airship. Yes. Yeah, so it'd be rigid, but you could fill it with hydrogen gas and then transport liquid hydrogen uh, inside of it and then you know, deliver that essentially anywhere you're allowed to travel. Now, there, there's a, a an interesting side note on this. Right now in Canada and the United States, it's illegal to use hydrogen as a lifting gas. Um, and the, believe it or not, it's not because of the Hindenburg disaster, but it was because of the uh, helium lobby. They did a demonstration for Congress um, showing that, you know, hydrogen is flammable and explosive and helium is much safer. And so uh, Congress agreed to ban uh, the use of hydrogen in American airships. But interestingly enough, even after the ban, they still allowed the German airships to come in and the Hindenburg disaster happened after uh, it was illegal to fill uh, airships, American airships with uh, hydrogen. Anyways, to make this system work, you would need to have um, you know, the, the, that kind of a ban lifted or have some sort of exception for it. Yeah, but a, I'm, yeah, I'm talking a, a lot here, yeah. So if anything's unclear, yeah. let me know. No, it's not entirely clear. I have a few comments. Uh, one, uh, in terms of submarine, I know that at least a military submarine, Germany is currently building submarine that use a hydrogen fuel cells. They take mm -hmm. hydrogen and oxygen. That's how they propel underwater instead of yeah. battery. It's turned out to be more efficient, even though you also have to carry the oxygen. And when you go back to the arid places, uh, I know that uh, like the H2O molecule, the oxygen is about eight times heavier than the hydrogen. Exactly. I mean, it's a one atom of hydrogen is 16 times lighter, but it has two, two hydrogen and one oxygen. So it's eight times. So you can have nine times more the weight capacity by delivering hydrogen. Yes. Assuming it's, it is safe, which is absolutely. Important. So, yeah, so going back to the example of using uh, Phoenix, I, I say, imagine we can get the airships to travel at about uh, 65 kilometers an hour, which mm -hmm. should be relatively easy to do. Um, there was a paper that was written, and I came up with this idea in, independently, but there was a paper written about using the jet stream to transport goods around the world using balloons or, you know, airships. And I kind of latched onto that. And with, of course, with today's capabilities of um, predicting weather, we can see where the jet stream is going to be. And, you know, let's say that we're, we have our polar energy platform up near the North Pole. Well, we can, you know, maybe fly towards Siberia and catch the jet stream and end up down in Arizona or something like that. And that trip uh, at about 60 uh, kilometers, I think it's about six 60 km 65 kilometers an hour and it's about 6000 kilometers so it works out to about 3 days of travel time um so if you had a fleet of say 10 of these uh airships constantly cycling so you'd have you know six in the air at any, any given time and say two at either desti at the destination in the uh original starting point um that makes 10 and gives you a 
time to uh, service the craft while they're, uh, you know, waiting to be fueled and this sort of thing. And I, I have some numbers. I, I say, um, you know, like for a one gigawatt power plant, let's say that you use 900 megawatts to generate power and you could basically fill up a, an airship that has um, twice the volume of the Hindenburg and, and twice the lifting power and uh, then just transport the hydrogen. Like you say, when you got the hydrogen, uh, it's one eight one eighteenth, or actually two, I guess, yeah, one ninth of the weight of water. So the beauty of the airship is you can then take it to an altitude. Uh, you know, in the example, I say, imagine that you build a power plant that's a thousand meters above the plane where where the uh, uh, the water is going to be used. So you've got you're going to be generating electricity at this power plant, and that would probably be used for peaking power. And then you'll have a continuous flow of water from that uh, from the hydrogen that's being generated there. And I, I did some calculations. I actually have have it open here, so I should be able to find the numbers for you. But the idea is, if you build a um, if you build a power plant that's at a thousand meters, you can generate electricity off of the um, off of the do. water falling as well. And of course, if you build the uh, power plant at twice the height, um, you can generate twice as much power. So there's literally no limit on, uh, well, no reasonable limit uh, in terms of what you could reach in terms of altitude for an airship. You could design it so it could go to the top of Mount Everest, for instance, and that's eight kilometers high. Yeah, and then um, you have, uh, if you use hydrogen, it could also be used for transportation, not necessarily just to build energy. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you could deliver the hydrogen and then it would be, you could use it for whatever you want. I give the example of the power station largely because of the uh, <clears throat> the desire to generate and capture the water. And I figure with, uh, with 20 of those power plants delivering energy to a place like Phoenix, uh, you would actually be able to support a population of a million people with the water that was being generated. And I go through all the calculations in the book there. So probably it would be useful in the Middle East as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting. I don't know what I've done, but on LinkedIn, most of my followers are from Saudi Arabia. So I think that they might be seeing something there with the hydrogen that uh, um, that they seem to like the sound of. Did you get any feedback from any any of the big energy company? That the, the... Um, I haven't talked to any of the energy companies at this point, but uh, interesting, I, I noticed that uh, at least one of the people who's following me is from Saudi Aramco, so you never know. Aramco, yeah, they don't have a footprint in the Arctic, as far as I know. No, they don't, but they might be looking to hire a Canadian engineer to uh, to take that on. I'm not sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, hydrogen versus batteries, which one do you think could be a better energy storage? So, they, again, I was just talking about how the um, technology is always changing with uh, with the research that's being done. Apparently, there's an Australian team that's managed to get uh, hydrogen generated at 95% efficiency. So if if they can do the same on the um, uh, fuel cell side of things, that would give an overall efficiency of, of 90%. And that is as good or better than, than most batteries. Right now, typically, um, you're looking at about 30 to 40 percent overall efficiency when you're using hydrogen so it's not as effective in terms of um, yeah, storing I thought, energy i thought the fuel cells up if you put the efficient yeah it, when you look at the entire system, yeah, the ballard, the about, so, system. so when you're uh, when you're generating the hydrogen there's inefficiencies when you're storing uh, shipping storing and shipping yeah they're unlike uh, gasoline and, and petroleum products Hydrogen has a nasty habit of escaping its containers. So the longer it sits, the more you lose. And that's especially true if you're looking at something like um, uh, cryogenic, you know, liquid hydrogen, where you have to keep it at really cold temperatures. Uh, otherwise, it evaporates away. But even um, when you're, you know, putting hydrogen through pipelines 
or in the case of, you know, what I was just talking about with dirigibles, there's going to be a, a significant amount of leakage. It's just going to go right through the walls of the airship or through the, uh, into the walls of the um, pipeline if, if the hydrogen concentration is high enough. Yeah, so the big, the big takeaway I took so far that uh, were actually were new to me, one is the using propane or to generate electricity or sorry, right. to generate energy that will uh, that basically electricity that separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. I assume oxygen is just going to release it in the atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're in the Arctic. If there was a big enough market for it, I mean, you're going to generate a lot more hydrogen than you would... Uh, that, that'll be commercially viable than the oxygen that you can generate. I don't know if it's worthwhile to produce oxygen in the Arctic and then transport it down because we can produce oxygen anywhere just by liquefying air. And, uh... But um, just so, so you know, this this concept, I, I've got a book here called Engineer's Dreams, and it was uh, written by Willie, Willie Lay back in the 50s. He was a an associate of Werner von Braun, and he brought uh, engineering um concepts to life but he talks about uh, i don't know if you've ever heard of the concept of ocean thermal energy conversion otec i have not yeah so the, the idea there is it's similar to what i was talking about earlier it you would run a vapor cycle from the temperature warm temperatures of the water and the lower uh temperatures in, in the deeper ocean so you pump up cold water you run a cycle and you can either have an open or closed cycle. An open cycle um, would allow you to get fresh water as a as a byproduct of this. So you're distilling the, the ocean water essentially at low pressure and low temperature. Um, and then the closed cycle would use propane or ammonia or some other uh, working fluid to generate your electricity. But it would typically be running at less than an atmosphere of pressure um, between the hot and cold because there's only... In that situation, you know, let's say the, the water temperature is 32 degrees Celsius at the surface and, and it's three degrees Celsius, 200 feet, meters down. So you only have 27 degrees to work with there. Whereas in the Arctic, we've got a, potentially a lot more because you can get to minus 60. And, and in Antarctica, it's not uncommon. Well, it, it's what it, about the summer? Some of it, it can get it can get down to minus eighty in in the Antarctic. I wouldn't say regularly, but it does uh, get there close but enough. It's the ocean below, right? And, and, and also and, the Arctic. I'm not sure what temperature it is in the in the summer. So it's probably the interval is going to be smaller, right? And and so I do talk about that too. And the uh, my thinking is you would probably have the polar energy platform optimized to work in cold temperatures. So you would spend 24 weeks up in the Arctic in the winter, then, you know, it would be a lovely job. You get to go to Antarctica when they're having their cold period. And in between, you have two weeks of transport, uh, transportation to fix up equipment and give people holidays and, and stuff like this. Um, but yeah, I, I figured that this would be like a, a job that would give you a significant hazard pay. And probably after four or five years, you could retire. Um, you know, similar to working in the oil patch, if you're putting in pipelines in the middle of winter, you can, you know, make 400000 a year type of thing as a welder. But um, anyways, the in that scenario, you would have the polar energy platform basically traveling north and south uh, during the cold seasons. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You could design it so that you stay in the Arctic year round. And in the summer, when you got 24 hours of sunlight, you know, make hay like the uh, the wildlife does. All the all the birds and stuff go up to the Arctic because there's so much energy that's available. So you could uh, set up something like a um, a solar, solar like, panels. You know, yeah, big solar farm up um, on the Arctic ice. If you're high at a high enough latitude, um, you know, there's still polar ice all year round up there, and uh, you could use the you know, solar energy to to do the yeah, con con concentrate the solar energy. Um, and then again, you, you can just dump that heat into the ocean. One of the one of the big issues, though, that uh, people are talking about is melting of the polar ice caps. And, and, you know, there are positive aspects of that in that we can have shorter transportation routes. But the uh, negative aspects of it in terms of global warming are uh, fairly significant. So if you imagine... Um, 
it, it's not too hard to imagine the, the polar ice cap the way it is right now in the middle of winter. When when spring comes along, the sun is going to be largely reflecting off of the off of the ice, and it takes a long time for the warm air to melt the ice, and so that energy, you know, at least thirty percent of it gets reflected back into space. But if that ice wasn't there, that water the the uh, water would absorb that solar energy and basically just warm up. Uh, and with the solar incidence about a thousand watts per square meter, um, you know, if that's being captured instead of re reflected back into space, that's going to make a big difference in terms of global warming overall. And it's that um, feedback effect that people are talking about where, you know, we could see completely ice-free um an ice for the Arctic Ocean in, in the summertime. So, and if yeah, that exactly. happens, it, it you know, living in in Alberta, I don't I don't see that as necessarily a negative because what that means is it's going to take longer for the Arctic Ocean to freeze, which means that it's going to be giving off a lot of heat into the atmosphere in the winter time, and it would probably mean that we'd have much more pleasant temperatures around here. Yeah, but time. people who live near the sea are probably going to see a sea level going up. Yes. So there, yeah. there is a lot of impact to global warming. That yeah. Probably but I, I talk about that in the book too. So, uh, you know, we got, if you have a lot of energy and, and literally we can, in, with the system that I described, we, we can generate more than 100 times all of the energy that humanity uses because um, the footprint of these things is very small. And what, what's the, what are the waste products that we're developing? Like I said, it's warm air, relatively warm air. So, you know, we're talking like freezing temperatures. And water. In, in colder, colder air. And then cold water. Well, one of the other issues that's facing the world right now is... Um, the Gulf Stream is getting weaker and the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, AMOC for short, um, is getting weaker. And, and so Europe, if you, if you look at London, England and Calgary, Alberta, they're both at the same latitude. But London is about six degrees warmer in the wintertime or more than six degrees warmer in the wintertime than Calgary is because they're surrounded by ocean, but also because we have the Gulf Stream pumping all this heat into, into Europe. And so taking a, another example, I'm not sure what um, you know Narvik or Tromso would compare to in Canada, but let's say Tromso is comp comparable to, um, to Ikaluit or something like that. The temperature there is livable, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, you know, it's 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 significantly warmer than what we see in a calorie. Yeah. yeah, I've been in Norway, so if you're close to the sea, it's it's above zero in the winter. Above yeah, they're, they they actually have projects where they're taking water from the deep in the fjords and using like using a, a a heat pump to suck the heat out of the relatively warm ocean water and heating some districts in in uh, in a particular town in Norway. So yeah, they got, they're very forward thinking and using their energy a bit more wisely than we are here, I think. So other than uh, putting up a, a book, do you have any plan of how to make this a reality? Because I think it's pretty awesome. Like <laughs> some of the concepts of these are things that I never heard. Like I heard about hydrogen and hydrogen economy, but it's mostly talking about taking solar panel and convert water into hydrogen and use it where it is. Yeah. Not, but then you need all the solar panel arrays, and you don't have sun in the in at at night or if uh, there are clouds. Yeah. And now we're talking about something that can work all year round, or at least all winter and summer. You can put solar array that they have twenty four hours sunlight in the yeah. So that that's pretty an interesting concept. And another big concept that I heard is that you can shift the hydrogen, use it for energy, and a byproduct water is something that could be used for drinking or irrigation. Or... Right. Well, and and so let me let me just read the table of contents for you, and, and it'll give you an idea, like the chapters and what they're talking about, and that'll give you an idea of uh, some of the problems that I'm trying to solve, because the first chapter is talking about the problems in the world that we can solve with this platform. And um, 
and then I go on and describe how, how we can change these things. So just a sec here. Okay, back from the break. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm just going to read the chapter one, the sections that I have in there. And it, the chapter one is called Some Problems of the World. The, the first one is addressing the frozen woolly mammoth in the room. And that's just talking about how difficult things are in the Arctic and why it hasn't been developed so much to date. But problem one, burning fossil fuels causes emissions. Problem two, sea level is rising. Problem three, ocean currents are changing. Problem four, the Arctic could become ice free. Problem five, 2 billion, 200 million people don't have clean water, according to the UN. Problem six, people are malnourished and starving. Problem seven, weather related disasters. Problem eight, wild fish stocks are being overfished. Problem nine, plastic pollution in the oceans. And problem 10 is the energy requirements of the computer networks. So the last section of that chapter is uh, called Every Problem is an Opportunity. And in the subsequent chapters, I talk about all of those different topics and how we can address them and, and make them better. So we were talking about the uh, propane cycle and, and how the, you know, one of the uh, side effects is, is having uh, potable water. Well, if 2.2 billion people don't have access or uh, to, to fresh water or, or have limited access to it. Obviously, there's a need there that needs to be um, needs to be addressed. And about 40% of the global population lives within 100 kilometers of the ocean. So if we can get water deliveries to a port um, that's close to the, you know, to where these people live, we can supply or supplement the water uh, that's there. So to give you an idea how much water I'm talking about. Um, for a one gigawatt power plant, if it was operating at 100% efficiency, which of course it, it would be. Just the one gigawatt, how many household it could supply? It depends on, on what numbers you use, but um, a one if you say that the average household uses 2000 watts of, of energy, a one gigawatt plant could supply half a million. Or, sorry, uh, is that right? Yeah. Divide that by a thousand, yeah, gigawatts. Yeah, ha about half a million people. So a significant number of people, 500,000. And um, yeah, anyways, for a one gigawatt plant operating with perfect efficiency, converting, you know, the uh, energy in the, uh, in the water transforming to ice. So basically what you're doing is you're extracting that heat out of the water uh, using the latent energy of formation of ice and converting that into uh, turning the propane into gas now to run your cycle. If that was working 100% efficiently, you'd be producing about three cubic meters of ice per second. So we know that it, nothing works 100% efficiently. So we're going to actually be producing more than three cubic meters of ice for a one gigawatt plant. Um, the amount of and uh, ice that you can, you know, produce three three cubic meter, three cubic meters. Yeah, that's not that much. I think a, fa a family uses that for three cubic amount. meters per second. Ah, per second. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. I think a one three cubic meter. It's what a family, if they don't have a large garden, use in in a month. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I, I use more than. Uh, well, a couple of cubic meters a month. I like to take my long hot showers and stuff like that. You know, I'm, I'm spoiled energy wise. And and uh, as as Jordan Peterson says, you know, if if you can go any place in your house and turn on a tap and have water running, you're within the one per, top one percent of wealthiest people who've ever lived. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we we have a lot of things that we take for granted and enjoy in this country here. So and, and in the developed world. And that's only supplementing the water supply. That's not going to be the only source. We have the no, it, source it, as well. It, exactly. It would be supplementing the water supply. And uh yeah, so it turns out I, I you know I, I do some calculations. Yeah, and it could be also used for irrigation in the desert area. Yes, absolutely. I, I do some calculations in here, and I figure that one of these plants at least in the early stages where there's just a few of them, you could make more money selling the water than you can 
by producing hydrogen and transporting it. Um, and, and I based that on, on the concept of selling bottled water. So um, the amount of money that, that people spend on bottled water worldwide is something like $300 billion a year. It's a, it's a crazy amount of, of money. And uh, I think I, I maybe should, I shouldn't, I do have the, uh, the numbers here in my book. Maybe I should actually look them up yeah, rather. But if, uh, but if you look at the top, it costs like uh, one dollar. Of... Exactly. Exactly. So when you go into the, you know, uh, when you go to a vending machine and you pay a dollar for half a liter of water, um, you're getting ripped off essentially. I shouldn't say you're getting ripped off. You're getting, you're getting a service that you're willing to pay a dollar for to quench your thirst at that moment. And so that's why Nestle and, and all the other companies, you know, Dasani and stuff, all the companies that are selling bottled water are making money hand over fist because a lot of them are, are using municipal water supplies or tapping into, um, you know, aquifers or wells that they don't have to spend a lot of money for. They turn around and, and sell that at the tremendous profit. So... There, there's a lot of money in that industry. And and what I would be looking to do, like the way I describe it in the book is, uh, you know, it could be very disruptive to that industry. But I, I you know, my, my goal isn't to fleece people. My goal isn't to, to, you know, just make money hand over fist. My goal is to help people, genuinely help people. Like Peter Diamandis says, if you want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. And, uh, the things that I'm talking about in this book, I, I figure could help pretty much everyone in the, in the world in some way or another. Yeah. So. And also it helped the climate. Exactly. Popping and now a huge amount of CO2 to the atmosphere. And it uh, yeah. probably you, won't avoid it. Yeah. You, I mean, you were asking, you know, why am I writing this book and, and this sort of thing? I, I want to see this happen. And, you know, it's not, not just a, it's bigger than me. Let's put it that way. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if I'll ever see see uh, these things built or or see it transform the energy industry in my lifetime. I certainly hope so, but um, you know, it's it, I don't have the resources to build it, and that's why I'm writing the book to kind of encourage people to you know people who do have the resources to help with this project and and make it happen because there's so many important things that I'm trying to do here. Um, and what, what about all patents? Positive. Do you have any patents on any of them? So like I, I showed you the book where I, where I talked about the ocean thermal energy conversion at the end of that chapter, he talks about this very concept. And <clears throat> if you go back in the literature, the idea has been around since like the 1800s. So it's not something that I could patent, but there are, ideas that I don't include in the book that are definitely patentable. So, you know, if, if somebody wants to talk to me about that, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about that as well. But uh, all of the things that I write about are um, are things that I would just like to see happen. So, for instance, you know, the 2.2 billion people with the water, imagine that you have so much potable water that if there's an earthquake in Haiti or something, you could just have, you know, ships sitting in the middle of the Atlantic going to wherever the water is needed most and, you know, do humanitarian work. Um, I, I mean, of course, you would be selling to markets. It, it, how, how much ice are we talking about here? Um, so if you imagine, I, I talk about um, having a one of these ice ships leaving, which would have over 5 million cubic meters of of uh ice in it and if when you, can, you say ice you mean water ice or hydrogen i'm talking water ice it would be frozen ice cubes i'm, I'm thinking they could be roughly the size of a cubic meter or so imagine a, a ship that's um coming through the strait of gibraltar it's you know about as uh it, it's about a kilometer long and a couple hundred meters wide and as it's going into the Mediterranean, it's sending little chunks of itself off to, you know, Spain, to Algeria, to Italy, to, you know, Egypt, to Greece, Morocco, Israel, and, you know, distributing the water for commercial use, um, initially, at least for commercial purposes, and, and generating money from that. And 
I picture for every bottle of water that you would sell, you know, the company could provide the equivalent water to uh, equ equivalent amount of water somebody who's needy in say Africa or Southeast Asia or something like this. Yeah, I don't know if it's uh, the concept will work because I know you can now the distill. I know Israel have distill, and it's about at least price from ten or twenty years ago was a one dollar per cubic meter. Yes, I don't know if it's now more expensive yeah. or cheaper. So there are, you know, Israel has distillation. They also Saudi, have Saudi Arabia, um, I believe has. Yeah, there, there's a huge amount of water desalination going on, and yeah, don't get me wrong, that's that's available and out there, but there's still billions of people who don't have access to the water and that's energy intensive right yeah but the price has to be less than one dollar per cubic meter right so i'm talking initially um when i'm talking bottled water i'm talking about uh appealing to a group of people who kind of see the vision of what i'm trying to do here and are buying into it and supporting it and then we can build more of these polar energy platforms. And eventually, you know, the price of per cubic meter would come down to, I don't know, maybe $4 per cubic meter or something like that, which is comparable to what, if you look at your, your uh, Calgary utility bill, it's about what you're paying right now is uh, $4 mm -hmm. per cubic meter. And wouldn't it be cheaper if you don't spare the hydrogen and then create the water and oh, create yeah. electricity and water? Yeah, so if if you're talking about going to a remote area that's deep inland, absolutely, you would use the the airship model to to transport it. But the amount of no, water no, I'm talking, talking about trans transporting hydrogen instead of transporting water, and then turn the hydrogen into water yes. at the destination and create energy in the process and get more water from per pound right. per kilogram. So, the, uh, you're absolutely right. It would be easier in terms of it being a less smaller cargo and you could burn it and all that. But because the um, the water ice is actually a byproduct of the generation process, you're generating a lot more of this potable water in the form of ice. And so that is why you would you know be able to sell it uh, for for large amounts. And I assume this uh, big water tanker will use hydrogen for propellant. Yeah, you could use hydrogen. Actually, I, I, I imagine it being so huge that you would use multiple forms of energy. Um, everything from, you could have solar panels on top of it. You could have wind power, like windmills on top of it. And you could have, uh, you know, hydrogen as well. Um, the, the hydrogen would have the benefit of having some of the cooling built into it like because it's all big ice cubes right but it, the, the thing about that too is you don't need to have like a huge metal oil tanker for this because we're talking about water what's the worst that's going to happen if you get into a collision you're going to spill fresh water into the sea oh boy <laughs> i mean it's not a dangerous thing right so you could literally use the same kind of material that uh that people use for rubber dinghies or or something like this basically tarps to uh to contain the ice it's buoyant because it's uh less dense than than the seawater and so there's no danger of it sinking there's no danger of it polluting um uh, the environment because you know the, it's leaking or something so if there was a leak you would end up having um, some salt water intrusion into the ship but because it's ice cubes you could still separate that at the destination, so long as it doesn't all melt. Yeah, I, is... I read. I remember some time ago, I read the article about plan to bring iceberg to the Middle East. Yes, yeah. So there, it's actually draw, take from Greenland. Yeah, and and this idea has been around for a long time. In fact, uh, it leads into one of the other things I talk about, uh, which is weather-related disasters. So there have been schemes that would uh, take ice cubes down to the Caribbean to try to prevent hurricanes from forming. Well, that doesn't work very well because I said ice cubes, I meant icebergs. That doesn't work very well because icebergs, of course, are oddly shaped. And if you try to lasso them, you're applying forces and they can tilt and, you know, um, then you and need to melt. The and they process. melt as they go. They and they melt as they're going on. Exactly. Yeah. So if instead of using icebergs, you have something that is, if you imagine the, the, what I'm talking about, um, you can literally have like a forklift going in 
and depositing these things orderly in an orderly manner. And then the same idea as what I was talking about earlier, you know, where you got stuff going from one country to another country to supplement their uh, water supply. Well, you could do the same thing in the in the path of a hurricane. And, you know, one of these shipments might not be enough to do much. But if you had a lot of them, you could literally cover, you know, the, a, a significant portion of the Caribbean o Ocean or Caribbean Sea with uh, with ice cubes. And one of the beauties of that is, like, if you have uh, an area that's relatively calm where the waves aren't too uh, too violent, when the ice melts, you're going to have fresh water floating on top of the surface water, just like in an estuary. And so the cold water will stay at the surface for a period of time until it mixes. And basically to have a hurricane, it requires heat from the surface of the ocean to, um, to power the hurricane. So according to uh, National NOAA, they have, um, they say that you need 26.5 degrees Celsius, I think, is the, is the temperature. Anything below that, and the hurricane will lose energy. Anything above that, it will gain energy. So if you have a coordinated system where you're spreading ice out over, you know, th hundreds, maybe thousands of square kilometers, that could have an impact on, on the uh, energy that's being supplied to the hurricane. And, and better yet is if you can get into the weather system before it forms a hurricane. So you just need to, you know, get into a wedge of the thunderstorms where, where the low pressure is rising and allow some high pressure air to get in there and disrupt the thunderstorm so the hurricane never forms in the first place. It would take a lot less ice to do that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with how we, we kind of started in the <laughs> part. Of, I read all, uh, some yeah. it, it, it's, books about that. It's fascinating. Uh, I mean, I, I've done a lot of research for this. I, I've literally been writing this for about three years, and I've been thinking about these ideas for longer than that. So, but even, uh, but even just solving the energy problem and water in arid places that yeah. Would be yeah, Very even cool. just arid places along the coast, because, I mean, you look at, well, California, you look at Namibia, you look at uh, Peru and Chile, you look at Australia, you look at Israel and all of the Sahara, uh, the Middle East, all of those areas are arid and, and accessible from the ocean. So if you had a, a huge amount of water available, then it, it could make a big difference. But I'm not even thinking like, you know, you don't want to have center pivot agriculture where, you know, what they're doing right now where they're sucking up all this this um, ancient water from the ground because you deplete your water resources that way. But the way that Israel is approaching it with, um, you know, having greenhouses where they've got um, reflectors for infrared heat. So they, it's cooler in the greenhouse than it is outside and and these and sorts of things. The water tap that uses less water to... Exactly. Irrigation yeah, and... For the irrigation, you've got the drip irrigation. And then you've also got like inside of a greenhouse, you can collect the condensate in the in the evenings and basically just recycle the water. So using a system like that would allow you to grow a lot yeah. more with less water. Yeah, distillation is not being used for that because it's too expensive. It's, uh, yes, well, exactly. Yeah, okay, I, I think... So... That, yeah, I, I did watch a documentary where they were talking about the um, one of the desalination plants in Israel, and some of that water was going to a, an agricultural project that was. They, I think they were growing fish and and stuff uh, like plants in a in a the same area or something. So yeah, we are about to run out of time, but uh, if we, we want to summarize. And, well, uh, yeah, if, if to summarize, uh, get the book to read all of the other crazy mm -hmm. ideas I have. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. w w what's the next step for them? I'm mostly curious, like, if anything is going to happen beyond a book. If there's any... Well, my, my intention is to try to get this into the hands of people who can make a change. And so I'm going to try to promote this on every type of media that I can, you know, like CBC Ideas, newspapers, different podcasts. Uh, I'd love to get this in the hands of people like Peter Diamandis and Elon Musk and Bill Gates, because, you know, they they have the capability of, of making the changes. And, and a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is applicable to them, particularly when I've got a chapter about computer networks and cybernetics. Well, of course, 
operating computer networks in the Arctic where you get free um, free cooling, cooling, essentially. That's that's a huge benefit. But not only that, if you think about propane... But then you need to transfer all the... Yeah, you, you need the energy. Yeah. There, and you also need to... The backbone. I, right. I'm working on well, IT. but that's where, you know, we, we got these satellites that Elon Musk is putting into space and, and Jeff Bezos Probably. and others. So accessing the internet... Uh, even in the Arctic, isn't going to be that difficult in the coming future. In fact, there are fiber optic cable networks that are being built right now. Uh, already Alaska is connected, and it's going all the way to Europe from Asia. So, you know, Can yeah, Canadian if, if Arctic the, is getting connected too. If the energy is cheap enough, it could be used to mine Bitcoin. That's one of the things I talk about. And um, not only that, when we're talking about the, the propane cycle, I was just talking about the temperatures around the freezing point of water, but when you're cooling computers, all of a sudden you've got temperatures that are, you know, 70 to 100 degrees Celsius. That makes that whole vapor process a lot more efficient. And so you can recover a lot of the energy it would take to operate the computers. Uh, so that reduces the cost again. And yeah, very... Uh, so talk about the building floating server farms in the Arctic. Well, power platforms that have that. I also talk about aquaculture. I also talk about, this is ridiculous, but I, I say with enough energy in the Arctic, so if you got, you got power, you can produce light, you get your heat from the water using a heat pump. Well, all you need now is a container to grow stuff in and you can grow anything. So... You could literally have farms operating in the Arctic. In the wintertime, they would run off of uh, the energy system that I was talking about. In the summertime, they could run off of solar energy. And you just have them insulated from the ice and insulated from the air. It, it could be done. And just imagine what that would do. You don't need to, like the, the most, I was just reading something recently about the most damaging thing that human beings have done to the planet is agriculture. So imagine if we can offshore our agriculture and and develop aquaculture and save wild fish stocks by farming fish. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot that can be done. Anyways, um, yeah, I'm hoping people will enjoy what I'm writing about here. And uh, these are, you know, Peter Diamandis talks about uh, moonshots and, and a lot of people talk about, you know, Google moonshot factory and all this stuff. So Usually people have one moonshot. I'm talking about like eight moonshots here. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's a big project. Like I said, it's more than one so person can do. When can where people can find you and where and when can they buy the book? So I have a, a website, infinite resources book.com. Um I'm still setting it up, but you can go there and see what I've got set up so far. Eventually, it will be available for purchase there. And as soon as it's published, it will also be available on Amazon and other outlets as well. So, Any estimation? Or... Um, I, I'm literally going through my edit of the last two chapters. So I'm going to have it in the hands of my editor by the end of the week. And with, with uh, self-publishing and stuff going on these days, like... Um, it, it might be available as early as the end of the month. End of February? February 2023, yeah. But it, it, it might take a bit longer. I still have, you know, some illustrations and things that I need to work in there and that sort of stuff, so. Okay, so thank you very much for host, uh, for being here and talking about the new right, talking about my and crazy potential. <laughs> and hopefully at least some of them will come through because it sounds awesome and uh, help a lot of the problems that the world is currently facing. So thank you and talk to you again at some point. Yeah, thank you, Ron, and I look forward to our next conversation. Okay, bye now. Bye-bye.